Signore e signori, buongiorno, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Azzarilli Marimò della New York University um, for this uh, conference dedicated to Aldo Moro. As you know, the, the title of the conference, the official title is uh, Global Interdependence and the Crisis of Democracy, Aldo Moro's Vision, George Moss's Interpretation. And we are delighted that uh, this initiative was conceived uh, together by the Accademia di Studi Storici Aldo Moro in Rome uh, and the George Mossi Program in History. And the occasion of this collaboration is the publication of the interview of Professor Mossi about Moro. Many of you probably know Professor Mossi is a great historian of totalitarianism, uh, but he had this incursion in the democratic history of Italy. And of course, he had uh, very insightful and very deep things to say about Moro and his legacy. Uh, I would like to welcome our guests uh, from Italy and especially Professor Quinti that was instrumental in building uh, this collaboration uh, along with the um, ambassador of Italy to the United Nations that from the very beginning supported, encouraged, and nurtured this initiative. On a very um, personal level, as somebody who works to promote Italian culture uh, in the United States, I really welcome this opportunity. And as I was mentioning before to Professor Renato Moro, um, I think that we owe this to Moro and it is to talk about his legacy as a statesman and also as a political theorist, a man of intellect, an intellectual. And I believe that we owe it to him also for the way in which he was killed. And coming this morning here, I couldn't help but think about um, a line from Inferno 5 that uh, Dante puts on the mouth of uh, Francesca da Rimini, where she says, il modo ancora m'offende. The way in which Aldo Moro's life was taken away, as we know, it was not only a cruel, barbaric uh, way to separate him forever from uh, his loves, his family, his friends, but also sort of created a permanent cage, a permanent prison that is exactly the experience that he had before dying and limiting on some level in the public opinion in general, in Italy too, I know, but uh, of course in the United States, many people have heard about Moro just because of that, ignoring everything else. And as you know, Aldo Moro was a man of great foresight and great depth of dualism. He was uh, somehow prophetic in his political vision, but also a very pragmatic person. He was a man of deep faith, and at the same time, he was very convinced of the laicità, that is a word that doesn't even exist in English, of the separation of church and state, and, and so on and so forth. He was a man that has undeniable party loyalty, and that yet he was ready to uh, establish ever-changing and ever-new alliances in order to uh, expand the basis of consensus of Italian democracy. And, all these things, along, of course, with his fundamental contribution to the establishment of the Italian Republic as a very, very young uh, founding uh, father, one of the uh, Padre Constituenti, with a very, very important role also in the subcommittee that actually wrote the Constitution of the Republic, really puts Aldo Moro in a very, very special position. And I think that's where we need to look at him. And I know that this uh, conference today will have exactly that function of providing a second liberation of Moro from this imprisonment in the dramatic events that are known to everybody. So this is why also I, I welcome you all here and, I, um, and, and I'm delighted that there are people that are following us uh, in live streaming from different parts of the world. And uh, of course, the, uh, the proceedings of the conference will also be video recorded and available on our website uh, once um, we are done with the little editing that they need. Um, there are many people that uh, are going to talk to you today. You must have seen the program on our uh, website. And um, I don't want to introduce them all. I'm very grateful for the presence of them all. 
And uh, I would like now to invite the second speaker that will present the introductory remarks, and it's Ambassador Cardi, who is the permanent representative of Italy to the United Nations. We are particularly grateful to Ambassador Cardi, because at this very moment, he's also the chair of the Security Council of the United Nations at a very dramatic juncture uh, on, the, on the world level. And therefore, we are more grateful than ever for, to him for having taken some time to be here with us uh, to remember Aldo Moro. Ambassador Cardi. Uh, Stefan, Director, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, because when we, with Gabriele Quinti, we decided to, to ask the Casa Zerilli Marimoto of the NYU to host this uh, seminar, you were immediately enthusiastic about it. And I think it's been an important uh, initiative uh, because of the historical and uh, the substantive uh, you know, uh, significance of the figure of Aldo Moro in Italian policy and in world politics. But before that, I just want to uh, apologize because, as you said, uh, Director, I will be going back uh, in about uh, 45 minutes because we have the President of the City Council. The world is not getting better, no, it's getting worse. And, <laughs> and unfortunately, this uh, ask for, for our presence in the Security Council e nearly every day, every hour, and it's uh, a, quite a busy time for us. Um, I also would like to, uh, well, of course, to thank again New York uh, University Casa Italiana for hosting us and the Academia of the Studi Storici at Domoro and the George Moss Program uh, in History of the University of Wisconsin for organizing the seminar. And let me just say that Gabriele Quinti, uh, who is uh, with Alfonso Alfonsi behind this, uh, he called me one day and he said, you remember me? I said, well, yes, your name says something to me. We were pupils at the same school 40 years ago, so 45 years ago. So it was a pleasure not only to uh, <laughs> collaborate professionally, but to also to uh, find again a, a, an old friend. Thank you, Gabriele, for having involved me. And before I, I have a few uh, remarks, written remarks, but just to say that when in 78 Aldo Moro was killed, I was a, not a very young, I was a 22 year old student at uh, La Sapienza, the um, political science department. Uh, and uh, I, of course, as everybody I remember vividly, not only the day he was killed, uh, he died. Uh, but also the, 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 the atmosphere, the political and social atmosphere of this year, I think we all remember, we all more or less are the same age. Uh, a very difficult period for Italy <clears throat> in which uh, terrorism was uh, uh, pushing our country uh, in the brink of uh, maybe, you know, uh, destabiliz destabilization. And, uh, and that day was really a sad day, but maybe it was also, you know, in, in a way, the turning point against the, you know, the fight against the Brigata Rossa in Italy. I always say to my, when we talk about terrorism in the United Nations, we talk a lot about that. I always remember that Italy was able, uh, with no special, you know, laws to defeat uh, a very strong uh, uh, terrorist organization that was really, you know, putting our, our lives at risk. But again, I am very honored to have the opportunity to open this seminar uh, on Aldo Moro's vision on, of international relations and global interdependence. Uh, Forty years after his tragic death, uh, his vision remains valid and extremely uh, contemporary in a way. It still resonates profoundly with our understanding of an international system uh, as one which must be uh, based on mutual trust and uh, international and respect of international law, uh, so that it may promote friendly relation based on equal dignity between peoples and states. And I say that in a moment in which, from our privileged perspective, we see each day this uh, system of international relations being put in jeopardy by terrorism, growing of criminal trafficking, links between trafficking and terrorism and, uh, you know, um, uh, impunity at international level for international criminal, uh, criminal uh, acts, genocide. So, uh, disrespect for human rights. So really, I think that uh, the vision and the, uh, the, the teaching of Aldo Moro is still very valid today. So Aldo Moro's ideas and statementship have been, of course, a strong force in shaping Italian foreign policy over the past decades. 
And as permanent, as they said, as permanent representative of Italy to the UN, I would be remiss not to mention uh, Moro's strong belief uh, in the UN and his deep commitment to multilateralism, which developed at a time when many newly, by the way, independent countries had joined the community of nations um, after the colonialist period. Uh, Moro harbored an understanding of the international system based on genuine multilateralism, what we are trying to achieve today, and it's not very easy, in which the United Nations would be the natural you know, centerpiece. Uh, in a speech to Parliament in 1969, he outlined the contours of an international system, and I quote, he said, that would be based on trust and guaranteed with means other than the mere balance of powers by promoting disarmament, valorizing the United Nations, and seeking in any way the detente and cooperation between people, which is still today the center of our work every day. And it's, as you know very well, not an easy task. To this day, Aldo Moro's focus on building bridges, which is what UN is all about, between peoples and asserting human rights, understood in a broad sense, to include civil, political, economic, and social rights, lies at the, heart, at the heart of Italy's approach to international politics. In an address to the 26th session, we are now in the 72nd session, 50 years have passed. At the 26th session of the UN General Assembly in October 1971, he urged, and I quote, that our organization, the United Nations, must remain the world forum in which all people can express their needs and where they can work to trace the most suitable path for solving mankind's great problems. It is this very vision that Italy, and specifically myself, of course, as permanent representative of Italy at the UN, work for each day. Not that we had had many successes, but if you think about the state of affairs internationally today, in which not only you know there is a resurgence, of course, the threat of terrorism in many, many parts of the world, we visit we, with the Security Council, we visited two weeks ago three Sahel countries in Africa, Mali, Mauritania, and Burkina Faso. And I can tell you that we saw firsthand the level of threat that, you know, in these regions, which are enormous and very difficult to control, the world, not these countries, the world is facing there. So really, I think we have a lot to do. Uh, in this respect. And uh, before introducing our distinguished guest and panel, I, I, I would just say a few words about them. I have been asked to say a few words about the life of Aldo Moro as a background to the discussion to remind what his life was. And he was president of the Italian Catholic University Students Association from 1939 to 1942. Since 1940 until his death, he was an accomplished researcher and a university professor who published extensively and taught regularly as a fundamental vocation he maintained for all his life. Between 45 and 46, he was president of the movement of Catholic graduates, and since his early years, he was a strongly engaged journalist also, becoming chief editor of papers and periodicals. Between 46 and 48, so after the war, he, uh, um, he was an influential member of the Constituent uh, Assembly in Italy and can be considered one of the founding fathers, as was remembered by, by Stefano, of Italy present day democracy. He became member of parliament in 1948, a post he kept continuously until death in 78, and between 53 to 55, he was president of the uh, Christian Democrat parliamentary group, the Democrazia Cristiana. From 48 to 50, he was foreign minister, so he was among you know, the predecessors in my, not me, but of uh, the foreign minister of today, under the Gasperi government, minister of justice, and then minister of education, introducing civic, civic education into Italian schools. In 59, he became the leader of the Christian Democrat Party, steering the group toward parties of the center left, opening to cooperation with the socialists, which was a really important issue then. And in 63, he personally headed the first government with the direct participation. Uh, he was prime minister another four times and at different stages also held the post of foreign minister. He also signed the final act of the 75, 1975 Helsinki Conference, uh, on the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, 
which is still a pillar of security in Europe, as rotating president of the Council of the European Communities. And in the 70s, he was the foremost Christian Democrat to cautiously believe in the inevitable need for a national solidarity government, that is, legislatures open to regular negotiations with the Communist Party, but not to their participation in the government. So he was really, you know, an accomplished figure personally, politically, and um, he was a central figure in Italian post-war politics until his death. Finally, allow me to introduce briefly today distinguished speakers. Renato Moro, the nephew of Aldo Moro, full professor of contemporary history at the University of Roma Department of Political Science, expert of the relationship between uh, religion, political ideologies, and mass society. He is presently president of the scientific committee of the team that is preparing the Edizioni Nazionali of the works of Aldo Moro and coordinator of the group for the historical research on Aldo Moro. Alfonso Alfonsi, president of the Accademia di Studi Storici Aldo Moro and author of the George Moss interview of, on Aldo Moro in 1979. He is a sociologist by training with an expertise in religion and modernization, science ethic, ethics, and science policies, social and cultural change, and socialization of scientific and technological research. Juliana Chamendez, professor, assistant professor of history at the University of Wisconsin. She cooperates with the George Moss program in history. An expert, she's an expert of modern European international history. Nadia Urbinati, <clears throat> co-chair at the Columbia University Faculty Seminar on Political and Social Thought. She's a political theorist, I hope it's right, uh, who specialized in modern uh, and contemporary political thought and, demo and the democratic and anti-democratic traditions. Gabriele Quinti, that I mentioned before, my friend Gabriele, director of the Italian Research Institute Knowledge and Innovation, he has carried out numerous activities involving studies and research and institutional capacity building on relations between state and society and the promotion of good governance. David Fogac, yes, Zeridi Marimo Chair in Contemporary Italian Studies, Professor of Italian, Chair Department of Italian Studies, expert on cultural history, media, and politics in contemporary history. So I have finished my, um, my job. And I would like now to hand over, I think, to, uh, I don't know if it's uh, Gabriele or uh, Alfonso Alfonsi. Uh, Mrs. Donny, you have the, now the floor. Mrs. Skydoni, yes, director of the George Moss Program in History at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. So you have the floor. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Well, once again, welcome to our seminar on global interdependence and the crisis of democracy, Aldo Moro's vision, and George L. Mossi's interpretation. I'm Sky Doney, the director of the George L. Mossi Program in History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And the Mossi Program is very proud to be one of the co-sponsors of today's conversation. Thank you especially to Alfonso Alfonsi and the Casa Italiana for their hospitality and also for the hard work of putting together today's uh, program. At the reception this afternoon, I would be very happy to discuss Mossy program activities with any of you, including our book series, our graduate student exchange with the Hebrew U, and our ongoing Mossy oral history project. But Alfonso has asked me this morning to just say a few words about what crisis meant for Professor Mossy. George L. Mossy's own biography was marked by crisis. Thinking back on his life and his memoir confronting history, he wrote that, quote, the swift passage of time was marked in my memory, above all, by political crises and upheavals. His first memory, he recalls, is taking place, quote, during the repeated economic crises of the Weimar Republic. Mossy described himself as a person who was nervous in daily life but calm when he faced a personal or a political crisis. As one example of this, during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, as he was coming out of his lecture hall, one of his undergraduate students approached him in this frenetic state and asked him what he was going to do. Mossy responded that, I'm going to the library 
If there's a nuclear attack, we won't be here. If there's not, I have a great deal of research to do. <laughs> crisis. In Mossy's earliest research and publications on modern Europe, crisis indicated cultural breakdown or a narrowing of political options. In his 1961 survey of the history of modern Europe, Mossy argued that the political negotiations and tensions of 1914 to 1933 could only be understood through the prism of crisis, moments that called the social or political order into question, or historical pivoting points that made the national fantasies of fringe political movements seem attainable. Famously, Mossy wrote that the Holocaust was an apocalyptic response to what he called the crisis of modernity. Elsewhere, he discussed crises of masculinity and anti-Semitism of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and our topic for today of parliamentary democracies. Through crisis, Mossy pursued a holistic cultural history that could take a global view in which he refused to separate the political from the religious, or the scientific from the aesthetic, the mythological from the symbolic, but always from the vantage point of someone who prized the European liberal tradition, someone who once said, every good person is a liberal at heart. Mossy valued the rule of law and individual rights and representative government, and those are very much reflected in the Intervista Su Aldo Moro. In the post-war period, Mossy was cautiously optimistic about the political state of Europe, an optimistic pessimist, as he said in one interview. In his own words, parliamentary democracies after the war supported free enterprise and political freedom, and the liberal democracies of Western Europe were comfortable with not having to provide complete answers for men and women who lived in constant states of crisis, as had been the case between the two world wars. But at the same time, Mossy cautioned that crisis was always latent in European culture. Nationalism had not died in the fires of Auschwitz and was available to provide Europeans with, quote, an authority, a hold in the speed of time to satisfy their longing for a community which would end their loneliness and give them direction. Like racism for Mossy, political crisis was a scavenger readily available to bring down democratic institutions if Europeans were not vigilant. Despite his publication record and his meditation on crisis, Mossi was surprised that anyone in Italy might care to know what he thought after Aldo Moro was assassinated in May of 1978. Mossi recalled the circumstances for that interview in his memoir, quote, in 1978, like a bolt out of the blue, I suddenly got a telephone call from Italy asking me to write the introduction to the collected essays of Aldo Moro, the kidnapped and murdered former prime minister, whose name was, for a moment, well known all over the Western world. This introduction took the form of a long interview about the parliamentary crisis of the 20th century, conducted with the editor of that memorial volume in a New York apartment of a close friend. And it must have helped to make me well known in Italy, as I have been an almost passionate Italophile ever since I first visited Italy with my mother in 1936. The many invitations to speak and the various prizes I have received there have been among the greatest delights of my life. It is fitting that we are in New York at the Casa Italiana to discuss Aldo Moro and Mossi's interview. One of our talking points today will be, I hope, the extent to which the Moro assassination and other moments of 1970s European terrorism can inform us about ongoing incidents of violence in Europe. I look forward to our examination of Aldo Moro as a politician, but also as a post-war European symbol. Thank you again for your invitation and for your participation in today's seminar. And our, thank you very much. And uh, our last welcoming remarks are coming from the Consul General of Italy in New York, Minister Francesco Genuardi. Buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti, good morning. 
It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I thank uh, the Casa Italiana, all the important representatives of the uh, Academia di Studi Aldo Moro, President Alfonsi, Director Quinti, and uh, the nephew Renato Moro, the representative of the George Moss uh, um, program. I think it's a fantastic opportunity this morning for you to focus on, uh, on the figure of such an important Italian statesman. I'm, I'm sorry, I have uh, also, as Ambassador Cardi, I'm not sharing the world, I'm just uh, dealing with the Italian in New York, but I hope it's, uh, it's a sufficient excuse also for me, for uh, I can't be here all the time. Uh, I think you will do an excellent uh, work of, uh, of deepening the, the figure of Aldo Moro. Let me just highlight uh, what I think there are three uh, key aspects of how much is a contemporary uh, intellectual and politician about the, his reflections on the legitimacy of politics, of policy, I think is a very is, is an issue of, of today, how much we have to broaden the, the consensus of politics to have uh, uh, to make work uh, democracy. And uh, his focus, as uh, Ambassador Caddy already underlined, on uh, north-south issues on the Mediterranean, being himself a man from Puglia, from the south of Italy, had uh, this very special uh, sensitivity for these kind of problems. And last but not least, his um, drive for dialogue. I think this is a very, very important. Uh, as a consular general of Italy in New York, we try to portray every day Italy as a superpower of dialogue and solidarity. And I think that uh, uh, if we can uh, have this kind of diplomatic activity is because of uh, a leader like Aldo Moro who had in his, uh, deeply in his uh, DNA this, this kind of uh, drive for dialogue. I'm very glad so that uh, Casa Italiana hold Today, uh, Casa Italiana is with a wide range of activities from the cultural, historical, but the, today they can focus also on politics, which is the, is still is, I think, the highest of all the human activities. So I think it's a, it's a beautiful morning for the Italians in New York because uh, you have uh, here the, the possibility to show once uh, again, once more, how much Italy in New York is alive and kicking, and I wish you an excellent morning, excellent work of this seminar. Grazie. So let me <clears throat> now introduce a little bit. I, I did it before, but just to give you the, uh, the order of uh, the interventions. So we will, uh, first of all, start with Renato Moro, Professor Moro. Um, and then we are going to have um, Alfonso Alfonsi, the president of the Academy of Studi Storici, Aldo Moro. Then there will be the intervention of Juliana Chamendez, the assistant professor of history at the University of Wisconsin. Then Nadia Urbinati, and there I must say I stand corrected because professors are, you know, there to correct <laughs> because she's professor of political theory uh, on the, at the Department of Political Science at Columbia University, and she specialized in modern and contemporary political thought and the democratic and anti-democratic <laughs> traditions. After uh, Professor Urbinati, we're going to have Gabriele Quinti, uh, director of the Italian Research Institute knowledge and innovation, then David Fogjak, the Rili Marimo Chair in Contemporary Italian Studies, and then the conclusion would be by Professor Fogjak. So with that, I give the floor to Renato Moro, Professor Moro. Thank you, it is a great pleasure to be here in New York to participate in this round table. I warmly thank Casa Italiana, the most program in history, the Italian representation at the United States, nations for this. I am an historian. I have personally known George Mosse. I have admired his work. His books have, have been a constant source of inspiration for my researches on religion and politics. I was honored to deliver the solemn laudation 
when the Italian University of Camerino granted an honorary degree to him. I am also a nephew of Aldo Moro. I have known him well, even though he was a really busy uncle, and meeting him regularly was difficult, but now I am coordinating an historical research group about him, sponsored by the Academia. Aldo Moro. So, as you may see, I am, I have many intellectual and sentimental links with today's event. Let's start with this. It has already been said. A victim of the Red Brigade's terrorists, Aldo Moro passed away in May 1978, nearly 40 years ago. So why, after such a long time, start reflecting on him again? Are we merely making a memorial representation, paying a surely, probably, deserved tribute to one of the protagonists of 20th century Italian history? It has already been mentioned. When George Mosse and Alfonso Alfonsi were conversing in New York, Aldo Moro was perceived in Italy and abroad through the lenses of his dramatic terrorist kidnapping. The image of Moro that emerged from the Mossi Alfonsi dialogue was new, revolutionary, and foreboding, and it is the reason why we are here today. But did Mossi's interpretation succeed in changing Moro's public image? Unfortunately, not. In the following decades, the Moro affair dominated the interpretative framework, and it did so not only quantitatively an endless bibliography, many editions of sources, various attempts to reconstruct and analyze the case, countless personal witnesses, the development of varied hypotheses, but also qualitatively, because the more widespread interpretative trend that emerged was to adopt a sort of rearward perspective, that is, reading Moro's biography not from the beginning, but from the end. Consequently, Moro's political personality continues still today to be the object of harsh controversies. Some authors, perhaps you will remember Leonardo Sciascia, depicted him as a sort of Levantine leopard. Others, with no less oversimplified generalization, portrayed him as a martyr of democracy, a sort of Italian Robert, or if you want, John F. Kennedy or Martin Luther King, a victim of the courageous choice of opening to communists. Contrasting interpretations of a political leader such as Moro uh, was, are not only legitimate, but inevitable, of course. Nevertheless, at a certain moment, I think it is necessary to base different interpretation on at least minimally thorough knowledge of a disputed profile. And in the same manner, it is not only legitimate, but probably right and proper to continue to perceive the moral affair as an open wound in our history, a one that is still asking for answers and truth, but also in this case, a simple consideration is sufficient. Almost 62 years of life versus 55 days. May the last days entirely eclipse a whole image. Only very recently, this situation has begun to change, at least in historical research, thanks to the efforts of the Academia and the group of historians I coordinate. Only an example. In 2011, for the first time since Moro's death, 
books and articles on all the other aspects of Moro's biography, outnumbered, even if only slightly, those devoted to the 55 days of the kidnapping. On the occasion of the 2016 centenary of Moro's birth, the first two scientific biographies have been published, and the Italian Ministry for Cultural Heritage has established, as has been remembered before, a national edition of Aldo Moro's works, of which I am president. However, this change started only in the field of research, without much impact, I think, on the general public and mass perception. I am a personal witness to the great surprise a recent television documentary movie devoted to Moro Coast in Italy precisely because it was not about his, his kidnapping but about his image as a man, an intellectual, a jurist, a Christian and a politician, of course. So if such is the situation then we have to admit that today it is necessary somehow to release Moro, at least in this regard, once and for all from the Red Brigade's jail, and to try, as Mosse and Alfonsi already did in 1979, to understand who really Moro was, simply through his political proposal and his visions of democracy. Today, we are able to retrace many features of his personality thanks to recent works, and I will therefore try su to summarize briefly them now, and I apologize in advance if, owing to the available time, my argument shall seem a little bit incontrovertible. First feature, often consider a professional politician Moro always found it extremely difficult to identify himself as such, and for a long time claimed the role of someone who should be placed beyond politics, as the title of one of his articles read. Only with great hesitancy and only under strong pressures did he accept to undertake a political career and he always experienced his commitment to politics as temporary, thinking time and again to seize it, even when he was at the peak of power. So, for example, he continued to teach regularly, every week in the university, loyal to what he considered his fundamental call, even when he became a leader with heavy responsibilities. This biographic fact relates to a deeper element, I think, the reflection on how the accomplishments of democracies are interwoven with the limits of the potentialities of politics. This is crucial in Moro. In 1976, in a speech to the Italian Christian Democratic National Congress, he said, I quote, this is the task of our age. The subject of rights is central in our political discussion. In the face of this blossoming, politics has to be aware of its own limit, ready to bend to this new situation which removes the rigidity of the reason of the state, giving it instead man's breath of reason. Second feature. First and foremost, this national and perhaps international leader was, it has been, remember, just a few minutes ago, a man of the Italian province. He considered the Italian South, in which he grew up, an important and positive resource for his country. At the same time, he, exactly for this reason, was among those Italian politicians who were more aware of the national balance. One of his close collaborators said that Moro applied this metaphor to the Italian situation. The country is as a house of cards. You may try to build a higher level, but you have to lay your cards with extreme delicacy and hold your breath. Otherwise, everything collapses. From this point of view, we may 
infer that Mother always took into account the value of that part of the country that might seem less culturally, socially, economically, and politically advanced, but that could not be forgotten if complete failure had to be avoided. So in his opinion, the existence of a deep country had always to be taken into account. It was not the country of the intellectual avant-garde or of the big city, of course, but it could give and had to give its own contribution. That deep country had to be understood and brought into the domain of progress. Third feature. Animated by a very deep religiousness, Moro was also one a man with a more secular culture expressed by Italian Catholicism. His connection to religion and laity was more of a perception, a way of being, a method rather than a precise theory. But it was deeply rooted in him and it was based on religious optimism, on respect for every human effort, and therefore on an inclination to mediate between even distant positions in the name of their, their truth. Moore arrived at Christian democracy only after many challenges. He enrolled in the party precisely because he considered it an ideal balance, capable of solving the many incomplete truths of others Therefore, his arrival into the Catholic party was grounded for him on an historical and secular political requirement and was not the consequence of a presumed religious belonging. From this perspective, the relevant role Moro played in the Italian constitution, constitution, constituent sorry, assembly is also easier to understand. He pointed out the great common value of that experience with particular forcefulness. He said to the assembly, I quote, if in the action of building a house in which we need to live together, we do not find a point of connection, of confluence, we may say that our work has failed. Divided as we may be among different political insights, among different ideological leanings, nonetheless, we are members of a community and we remain united in it on the basis of an elementary, simple idea of man which joins us and determines a mutual respect towards each other. Fourth feature, Moro was a politician of the study I have a personal memory from my youth. One summer, in a small city in Latium, Terracina, where our families lived very close to one another, I often saw him sitting in a small terrace facing the sea, totally absorbed in reading a huge pile of newspapers that reached up to his knees. <laughs> Today I understand why. He was trying to grasp the Italian life in depth. He was searching for the actual features of a society that he perceived as problematic and disharmonious, but whose primacy in front of politics he believed had to be reaffirmed and defended. He once wrote, I quote again, nothing needs to be considered dead, nothing damned nothing out of the lifeblood of society. This is the gigantic challenge of the full insertion of the masses into the life of state. Rather in his vision, based on a poised intelligence, on ethical moderation, and on an instinct for continuity, politics was positive exactly when, instead of being superimposed on society, was able to understand, organize, and guide its needs. In 1974, at the Christian Democratic National Council, he stated, I quote again, a party that wishes to lead cannot not understand, cannot not follow, cannot not take responsibility for all that is at the source of his political purpose, the concrete reality of interests, values, thoughts, ideals. It is not surprising then 
that modal writings clearly show the development of a clear-headed awareness of the distance that was developing between politics and society and on the effects that this might have in collective life and the stability of democratic system. To conclude, is it possible to point the reason why the essential elements of Aldo Moro's political personality continue to involve us, women and men of the, of the 21st century, and involve the problems of our difficult democracy? This too is one of Moro's terms. Moro is surely outdated, distant from the harsh, conflicting, and even impoverished political realities of today, from the process of entropy our democracies seem to have entered. At the same time, the same distance makes Moro extremely relevant, I think. In an age in which politics tends towards professionalization and focuses on technique, with an increasingly extreme submission to the rules of communication and of economy, Moro reminds us that in any case, politics remains a vocation, and it has to be experienced as such, as a commitment that cannot not have deep ethical roots, and that has to be linked to the need for building or rebuilding a supply of moral energy and civil engagement on the foundations of society. In an age in which politics tend to divide and juxtapose the more developed and cultured parts of our country from the deep rest, sometimes interpreting exclusively the reasoning of one side, sometimes of the other, Moro stresses the need for a balance that must always consider our communities as a whole. In an age in which religious radicalism and fanaticism seems to erect insurmountable walls, in an age in which exitable masses again propose totalitarian and integralist issues, Moro, a politically active believer himself, reminds us that believers do not bring any exclusive truth in politics, and that it is fundamental to find a way for protecting both the big issues and the basic secular foundations of citizens' rights. In an age in which politics tends towards simplification, Moro testifies to the value of the politics of complexity, inclined not to shout but on the contrary, ready to recognize the challenge of understanding, of lending an ear. In an age of great difficulty for politics, Moro explains, as very few intellectuals do, the reasons of the crisis and at the same time, the crucial value of politics itself. In an age of estrangement between institutions and the younger generations, Moro shows that a strong focus on students and their educational problems is a crucial predictor of the future. It has been recalled the fact that it has introduced civic education in public schools. In an age of globalization, it was a tireless weaver of connections between states and peoples. It is no coincidence, I think, that he was among the first back in 1965 who spoke of the existence of a world public opinion. It is this, Aldo Moro, I think we need to rediscover in a time of crisis as a treasure for the present and for the future. Thank you for your attention. So <clears throat> thank you, Professor, for your um, insightful uh, statement, also personal point of view. Uh, I, I have the honor now and the pleasure to introduce Alfonso Alfonsi, the president of the Academy of Studies Storici Aldo Moro, and author, as I remember before, of the George Mossi interview on Aldo Moro in 79. Uh, I will then have to gi give the moderation role to Professor Fogac, you will be the one giving the floor the next time. And thank you again to the Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. And the floor is to Alfonso Alfonsi. Grazie tante. Buongiorno a tutti. Uh, there are things that are being changed uh, from one way and another today. But as president of Academia Aldo Moro, I cannot do 
without, uh, in my turn, thanking, uh, first of all, the Zerilli Marimo uh, Casa Italiana for the enthusiasm and competence in, in hosting and co-organizing this uh, event, and uh, uh, Ambassador Cardi that's uh, now living and that took uh, pre precious time from World's Affair to be here and um, to our world affair, in a sense, and uh, to the George Moss program, and all the people that are present as uh, speakers, as participants. And I, too, have a personal note, um, because as has been recalled, the interview I had with George Moss was here in New York. As a matter of fact, he was staying at a friend house, has been said, in Broadway and uh, 93, if I'm not mistaken. And I was uh, at a friend's house in Broadway in, in 86. And if we think how New York is, that was perhaps meaningful in a sense. And it was, uh, uh, for me as a very young researcher, a, a great experience. Uh, not only from the scholarly side, but also from the personal side, because I met also a great person, as together with an astute uh, uh, scholar, and uh, which was seminal in my intellectual uh, formation. And, uh, and we started a relationship that went on over the years and honored me. Uh, but um, certainly Aldo Moro and George Moss are two outstanding figures, each in his own right, but their connection is not self-evident. Moss himself, as I've been recalled, was amazed that he was chosen for this, and perhaps some of you share his uh, curiosity on this matter. So um, let me try and provide a few uh, hints on why uh, this happened, this, uh, and uh, why it was George Moss who was asked to make uh, an attempt of the first comprehensive interpretation of moral political figure. Uh, first of all, one should consider, as uh, Renato Moro has uh, already mentioned, that the political climate after Aldo Moro's kidnapping and assassination by the Red Brigade was dominated by a heated debate that invested Moro's own person. We cannot forget that there was a sort of stigma on his figure for his behavior that tend to be projected backwards, as Renato has mentioned, obfuscating to a certain degree his whole political experience and even his human figure. In such a climate, what was then the Fondazione Moro decided to make available to the public Moro's own voice by publishing for first time, a vast selection of his speeches and writings, with a large set of historical and linguistic notes. And the volume, as has been heard, was to be preceded by a long introduction in the form of an interview by an historian of international renown. Uh, for two reasons, because this could help to look at more from a comparative international perspective, a broader vision, but at the same time, uh, someone who will be above to the controversies and prejudices that were rampant in the Italian political and cultural scene in that moment, in connection with what had come to be regarded as the Caso Moro, the Moro affair. But the choice came to George Mosse for more substantial reason, because of uh, um, his very approach to historiography. Uh, in fact, it was the late Giancarlo Quaranta, um, who I like to recall in this moment, that at the time was director of the Fondazione Moro, who had the idea of such an interview. In fact, our interest for the work of George Moss stemmed from the appreciation of his revolutionary approach in stressing the saliency of immaterial elements uh, sentiments and emotion in the historical processes, and the role of myths and symbols in shaping the forms of political participation and social integration in modern mass societies, an approach that we hoped at the time could provide a fresh perspective by placing Aldo Moro in a broader context. 
What I must say intrigued us the most was the possibility of asking an historian who possessed a deep understanding of cultural phenomena and who made use of anthropological categories to reflect on a politician who has been, as has been recalled, was also a scholar and a thinker. And I think that had an almost sociological aptitude to perceive and interpret long-range processes of social change. But on this I will soon return. So George Mosse was approached through the good offices of Renzo De Felice and Giorgio Spini and accept to be interviewed, suggesting uh, to have it here in New York. It was the beginning of 1979. Uh, he received a, a large a selection of Aldo Moro writings and speeches, which of course he could read uh, in Italian. And I can still visualize the many remarks that he made with his rather broad handwriting on the margin, on the type of sheet that he used to quote during our interview. There are many more particulars on uh, an interview that when uh, on for three weeks, and then there was a lot of editorial work. Mm, there is no time to be in, go in the detail, but if there is some interest in the debate, we can say something more. I have one thing I want to recall. At first, George Moss was, understandably, um, rather cautious, lest he could be involuntarily involved in the controversies that still characterized the Italian debate on the Caso Moro. In the end, however, in, in our interaction, he became fully confident on our project, his reasons, and the way we were pursuing it. A confidence, as I recalled, that lasted over the years in many other uh, occasions of cooperation. Again, as um, Renato Moro mentioned briefly, and the Historian Donatello Aramini brilliantly reconstructed in his uh, works and in the critical note, at the time of his uh, first publishing in 1979, Moss's analysis, with a few exceptions, did not stir much interest. And in some cases was strongly criticized, being considered the result of a superficial judgment of a foreigner that could not grasp the intricacies of Italian policies. which went together with uh, a broad uh, uh, phenomenon of the reception of Mosse in Italy by that time in which I will not enter. But what happened was that the impact of the interview instead was felt in the long run. The, that led uh, to the uh, reprinting it, uh, of it in Italy a, a year ago and uh, um, on the discussion of having it printed for the first time in the English language, in which it doesn't exist at the moment. And, um, but even before this uh, reprint, it was being rediscovered by a new generation of historians who found in Moses' interpretation seminal ideas and valuable hypotheses to orient their own original research. And some of this is going on with the help of the uh, uh, Mosse program, I must say. So, what was Mosse's take on Aldo Moro? First of all, he uh, starts by placing Aldo Moro and his endeavors, his culture, his ideas, beyond the close Italian scene. In a broader framework, of the transformation of Western parliamentary democracies in the 20th century. In this perspective, he perceived Moro as a statesman whose political career, here I quote Mosse uh, from the uh, English transcript, has a more general significance because it touches the crisis of parliamentary government, which has been so important during the whole of the 20th century. So according to Mosse, Moro had to face up with some of those recurring crises that a parliamentary government meets in times of economic and social stress in the age of mass politics, when powerful myths and symbols are rather used to mobilize the people to subvert or challenge parliamentary government rather 
than to support it. So in most of you, Moro had an original approach in tackling this kind of crisis, and it was to try and broaden the basis of parliamentary government so that it was possible to experiment and take into account the nature of mass politics. A constant in Aldo Moro thoughts and action was then the effort to pay heed to the aspiration and desires of the people in order to further integrate them and promote their participation within the democratic processes. And this in accordance with what he perceived as the social development and the cultural changes that were occurring in Italy. This was a crucial importance in the case of those masses of workers that felt to be at the fringe of the political system and needed a sense of representation and a possibility of representation. According to Mosse, Aldo Moro's concern reflected his view of the state, and this is important, as a process, as something that was ongoing, responsive, and except for representative government itself and its uh, framework, not fixed once and for all. Mosse cited various writings and speeches by Aldo Moro in support of these views, which I will not <laughs> quote for brevity, in, but in all of them, Moro referred to the building of democratic state not as a finishing line, but as a starting point for, and here I quote Moro in translation, it, there was to come a felicitous overcoming of egotisms, the achievement of a just expansion of human personalities. And it was exactly in this inherently dynamic aspect that, tomorrow, the democratic state was in its very essence the negation of what he called la rozza, rozza chiusura, the coarse rigidity of the totalitarian state. And uh, the democratic state, in this view, was flexible enough to play an active role as, again his words, a liberator. And he says, I quote, it is not an external order to be established. It's not a power to be preserved or developed. It is meant to be freed. It is a moral progress of society, the only true progress that needs to be secured. There is no time to discuss in detail Moss's analysis, even though sometimes the real beauty, not only the devil, is in the details. And perhaps we can discuss something of this again. But I would like to stress that in Moss's view, Moro's approach was always consistent with his principal idea that to preserve democratic go uh, parliamentary government in a rapidly changing situation, one has to look at it not as something based on a status quo, on a political monopoly of one or a few parties, but rather as a process, constantly bringing in new groups of society, taking into account the alienation of groups and trying to stop that alienation by broadening the liberal base. According to Mosse, in this effort, there seemed to be a dialectic between Moro's will to preserve the democratic parliamentary state and his belief that this same state cannot survive if it is not able to accept change and be responsive to the evolving needs and aspiration of the people. Moss saw uh, Moro's policies in the different decades as consistent with, uh, with this approach, whether he, Moro, was uh, broadening the political base in the early 60s uh, by bringing the socialists at the center coalition, or whether in the late 60s he was trying to draw the student revolt into the parliamentary process, or whether in the late 70s he confronted the crisis of Italy with uh, the um, responding to the idea of compromise historico and opening a dialogue with the communists. There was the same principle uh, remained in operation to uh, Moss's view. So, mm, in this regard, I would like to point out 
as most in self noticed and as many scholars nowadays acknowledge, that Aldo Moro's strategic vision was informed by what I before I've called his sociological attitude, that is, his capability to interpret long-reaching social phenomena in their making. As the Italian historian Piero Craveri put it, Aldo Moro had a unique capacity to see social and political events in an historical perspective, an attitude that led him alone among the Italian politicians of his time to perceive the anthropological depth in, of the change that, dating from the 68, was occurring in the Italian society, which, according to Moro, was changing its orientation from vertical, his words, to horizontal. Of this process, the proliferation of right-wing and left-wing extreme groups was but an epiphenomenon, albeit a violent, dangerous one to be guarded. But more in depth, in Moro's world, it was, I quote, a new humanity in the making. We knew moral orientation, new demands, sometimes disquieting, sometimes difficult to respond with, but that challenged the political community to understand, and after understanding, to respond. In concluding my remarks, and in the light of a possible projection of this debate into the contemporary scene, I would like to come back to Moss's view of the intrinsic inherent fragility of parliamentary democratic process to capture the hopes, imagination, and aspiration of the people. This, according to Moss, creates a sort of paradox. The more the masses, as in totalitarian, totalitarian states, but not exclusively in totalitarian states, you know, the more the masses, I say, um, are mobilized through powerful myths and symbols, giving them the feeling of participation and integration, the less are they really empowered in participating in the actual governance of the polity. And where they have some power of this, sometimes this is not represented or is not recognized or integrated. It is my conviction, and I conclude, that Aldo Moro showed an orientation to tackle with Moss's conundrum precisely in this peculiar understanding of the democratic process that Moss pointed out. To me, the most complex and interesting part of Moro's position in this lies in the fact that it does not simply aim at establishing the basis for parliamentary democratic interaction in the negative as a simple agreement not to arm each other, a mere cold-blooded relativism. Rather, the democratic process in itself finds its essence in harmonizing a plurality of aspiration and worldviews. So this very process, in Moro's idea, can inspire passion, can be, as he says, intensamente umano, intensely human finding its substance not backwards, towards a single unifying identity, but forward, being driven by a common strife towards higher levels of liberation and progress, his words, and inspired by a fundamental commonality as basically human beings. He often said that the construction and preservation of a democratic state should be understood in senso largamente umano, in a broad human sense. In Moro's vision, even compromise, which is uh, often a disregarded, sometimes lampooned feature of democratic policies, could recover its etymological density in that it stemmed from medieval Latin com promissus, to make to together a solemn woe that engages us all. In expressing this vision, Aldo Moro, uh, often regarded as obscure and confused, could be quite eloquent and inspirational, as in this article with which I conclude. I quote, he is saying, in this moving together towards a higher life, there is naturally room for diversity, contrast, 
even tension. And yet, even though we may sometimes be deeply divided, also opposing one another, if necessary, as adversary, we know we have in common, each for his own road, the possibility and duty to go farther and higher. The diversity that exists between us does not stop us from feeling part of a great human achievement. Civil peace corresponds to this great endeavor of free human progress, and in this, peace, respect, and recognition emerge spontaneously while we work, each on his own way, to exclude mediocre things to make room for great things." Unquote. I feel that Alto Moro, in this, like in other writings of his, conveys a sort of epos of a democratic process, in its drive to go farther and higher, to go away from mediocrity, with the active and passionate respect for diversity grounded on, using Aldo Moro words again, a simple elementary idea of a human being, una semplice elementare idea di uomo. I think that uh, even today, having the capability to um, understand the in depth the process ongoing, even those that are more disquieting, even those that are more difficult to reconcile with their deepest belief, then there is the chance, as Moro said, to understand and respond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfonso. Well, unlike Sebastian Ocardi, I don't have to solve the world's problems, so I'm just <laughs> uh, able to stay and share the rest of this. Um, I'm David Forgatch. I'm uh, Zirili Marimo Professor of Contemporary Italian Studies in this uh, Department of Italian Studies at NYU. Uh, I've been involved with planning this event, and I'm very pleased to it's finally all come together and to have everybody here. So thank you also, Gabriele and Alfonso, for being so collaborative and supportive with us in getting this off the ground. Uh, I'd also like to thank the speakers for being so disciplined about time. It's pretty rare when everybody keeps exactly to 15 minutes, so thank you. That means we'll all finish and get to lunch on time. Um, so next up is um, Juliana Camedes, who is um, like Sky Doni in the Department of History, University of Wisconsin, Madison, which of course is where George Mosse taught for over 30 years. I think he moved there in 1955. Um, and uh, Juliana is uh, assistant professor of history there. She has a special interest in European international order in the late 19th century and the 20th century. She has published widely on um, internationalism in its liberal, communist, anarchist, and particularly Catholic variants. Um, and um, she will speak next, and then after that will be Nadia Urbinati. So, Juliana, welcome. Buongiorno. Thank you for the generous introduction and um, for all those who played a part in organizing this event, in particular the Accademia di Studi Storici Aldo Moro, the Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò, and um, the University of Wisconsin Madison's Masi program. We've said many things so far, but one thing that I think we haven't yet stressed is that Aldo Moro and George Masi were men very much of the same generation. Mauro was born in 1916. Masi was born just two years later in Berlin. Mauro, as a young anti-fascist lawyer, was able to remain in his country throughout Mussolini's time in power. Masi was not as lucky. The German Jewish scholar was forced to emigrate following Hitler's rise to power in 1933, moving first to England and then to the United States. Interestingly, both Masi and Mauro emerged from the traumatic experiences of the war with a shared commitment, not just to building a democratic Europe, but to restoring the legitimacy of democracy itself and thinking through how to do so. 
Additionally, as has been mentioned, perhaps because of their own life experiences, neither of these men viewed the newly reestablished European democratic order as permanent. Instead, they viewed it as very fragile, unstable, and still subject to serious threats from both the right and the left. In 1959, 15 years after Aldomaro had played a founding role in building the new democratic Italy, in drafting Italy's new constitution, he himself um, went so far as to say that democracy had yet to be built, that it was still um, a process rather than an end point, as um, Alfonso Alfonso just reminded us. In the spring of 1978, when Aldo Moro was kidnapped and then assassinated, many interpreted this event as, a, as proof of the fact that democracy was in, in fact still fragile, still under construction, still subject to serious threats. Within days of Motto's mo murder, an affair exploded, and the core question at the heart of the Motto affair was a question that had been of great interest to Aldo Motto himself, and that was of interest to George Massi as well, Qu a question that both of them had puzzled over for decades. Was Western European democracy truly unstable? Was it under threat? What could maintain Europe's democratic order and protect it? And very importantly, if parliamentary democracy could not be saved, then what future lay ahead? So it was perhaps because these questions were so close to George Massey's heart that um, the great German Jewish historian overcame his initial hesitations, which were just mentioned, and agreed to an interview um, with Alfonso Alfonsi in early 1979. He repeatedly expressed his hesitations about them, he, about um, Agreeing to this interview, he didn't consider himself an expert in Italian history or in current affairs, um, and he didn't want to get embroiled in a series of ongoing polemics about whether the Italian government should have negotiated with the Brigate Rosse, the organization, of course, responsible for Mato's abduction and murder. But luckily for us, Masi agreed to this interview. The year was, again, 1979, in which this interview took place, but the core message of this interview is eerily resonant today. Alfonso Alfonsi asked George Massi if the widespread fears that democracy was in crisis were correct, and George Massi's answer to that question was yes and no. <laughs> So on the one hand, Massey suggested that European democracy was not on its deathbed, that some of the concerns were overstated. But he did specify that it was necessary to identify threats to democracy and deal with them appropriately. On the other hand, Massey admitted that though he was no prophet, he was unsure of whether European democracy would actually succeed in the long run. And this was because of that deep internal paradox that um, democracy in the era of mass politics was um, dealing with and that according to Masi, no one had yet really been able to solve. For Masi, the paradox was this. As Masi explained it, to succeed, democracy needed to really integrate the masses into the state. However, the existence of modern industrial society led most naturally not to the strengthening of the state, or much less of liberal democracy, but rather the fractioning and atomizing of individuals, which hungry for forms of expression would rush to seek out forms of sub-state allegiance through, for instance, um, associational life, trade unions, cultural and professional associations, and so forth. This process, in turn, instead of protecting and promoting democratic stability, would actually further fracture society. This was Masi's big um, concern. And this process of fracturing would make democratic consensus ever more difficult, um, making it ever more challenging to stitch all of these component parts back together that had begun to identify their identities in opposition to one another. Interestingly, in the interview, 
Masi suggests that Mussolini had actually come up with a solution to this paradox, although it was a very disturbing and troubling solution. Mussolini's solution to the problem of bringing the masses into the state in the era of industrial society was to create a single party state which reintegrated all of those subgroups and associations within the framework of state run organizations. So in other words, Mussolini had created unity and consolidated the state, but in the process he had quite intentionally killed democracy. It was within this context and within this theoretical framework that Masi really elevated Aldo Moro and celebrated him for steering a different course. As Masi saw it, Aldo Moro's leading legacy was that Moro had attempted very hard to find a way to bring the masses into the state all the while remaining firmly committed to democracy and to shoring up democracy. As Masi saw it, Mara, uh, Mara chose um, kind of three different ways in which to protect and promote democracy. And here too, you know, Masi said some um, interesting and surprising things. So first, Masi said that Mara had actually taken part in a sort of healthy mode of myth making, specifically by appealing to the liberal myth of the nation and of national unity. Just four years prior to this 1979 interview, Masi had comp completed one of his most famous works, The Monumental, The Nationalization of the Masses. And clearly, he was well aware of the poisonous role that nationalism could play and had played in recent European history. But in this interview, very interestingly, he argues that not all forms of nationalism are the same, and that a liberal democratic nationalism, which is committed to the protection of individual rights, can be a useful glue for citizens. After all, Masi says with some um, palpable confusion that nationalism remains, quote, the most powerful idea of the 20th century. So in 1979, at least, it seems as though he felt it was hard to get away from it. But on Masi's read, Mauro's appeal to national unity was acceptable, and in fact even laudable, because it was in keeping with Italy's liberal tradition. And uh, for instance, uh, Masi cites Cavour repeatedly throughout the interview as a figure who upheld that um, liberal tradition. Mato's second move for preserving it, uh, and protecting democracy, according to Masi, was to lay a great deal of emphasis on pluralism. And this is another point in the interview where um, Masi's later readers uh, you know, were a little bit upset about what he said. So Mato, on Masi's read, was committed to pluralism in the sense, according to Masi, that Mato broke ranks with many fellow Christian Democrats. Unlike several members of his party, Mauro was not interested in the project of building a Catholic or confessional state, which was a project that had a long lineage in Italian and European history, and that, uh, for instance, the central government of the Roman Catholic Church in the 1940s and 1950s was still very much interested in pursuing. Instead, Mauro drew on um, a vision of a plural secular state, which was being espoused by what was then a minoritarian strand within European Catholicism represented by figures like Jacques Maritain. According, to, and even more so by um, Mounier, Mauro had come to embrace a vision of pluralistic and democratic society, which, as um, Maritain and Mounier argued, was most in keeping with Catholic teachings. So there was a notion that there was still a Catholicism that undergirded the legitimacy of the state, but the goal was not the construction of um, a religiously exclusive state or a state in which um, laws needed to be drafted in keeping with um, directly with, with Catholic um, and canon law. In another way, Mato was also ahead of the times and interested in plurality because he wanted to protect regional variation. And this is another element that Masi lays a great deal of emphasis on. He was not interested in subsuming all Italians under the same label, but instead um, celebrating the 
plural and regional differences within the Italian peninsula. And this was not an abstract matter. So for instance, um, between 1962 and 1966, Mata played an important role in brokering agreement uh, brokering an agreement on the Alto Adige question, which had been um, quite controversial for a great deal of time. And he did so by entering into conversation with local ethnic groups, with the Austrian government, and of course, um, the Italian government as well. So he um, saw all parties as central to resolving these questions of regional identification. So Aldo Moro, again, on George Massey's read, had gotten two essential things right. First, he had created an appealing set of rituals and myths for the new Italy through an appeal to Italy's liberal nationalist tradition. And second, he had articulated through both his words and his practices a pluralist and non-exclusionary ethos that enabled subgroups to feel a part of the democratic state rather than excluded by it. Third and finally, according to Massi, Mato had attempted to solve the paradox of disunity through the model of a grand coalition headed by the Christian Democratic Party. This grand coalition was to contain from 1963 the socialist, and if Mato's, Mato's plan had succeeded, from 1978 it would have been open to dialogue with the Communist Party as well. As Massey saw it, these moves were part of Motto's attempt to, quote, broaden the basis of the system of parliamentary government and take into account the nature of modern mass politics. Now, Motto had made the turn towards coalition um, with these groups only once he had come to the conclusion, again, that Italy's democracy was still not consolidated and coming under serious threat, especially from forces on the right. In the interview, Masi celebrates uh, Motto's 1963 decision to welcome the Socialist Party. And um, in doing so, Masi notes that Motto was able to, uh, quote, see past the rhetorical baggage of the Socialist Party and realize that this was a party that was, in fact, sincerely committed to defending the parliamentary system. He also notes in this context that it was a shame, Massey says, that social democratic movements in the interwar years had not benefited from um, grand coalitions of this sort, which would have moderated perhaps the strength of far right appeals. However, the interview from 1979 shows that Massey is not quite as comfortable with Aldo Moro's 1970s decision to enter into conversation with the Italian Communist Party. Throughout the interview, Massey displays an evident distrust of the Communist Party's capacity to play by the democratic rules in the first place. He calls into question the extent to which the Communist Party can be deemed interested in building unity rather than disunity. And he does not seem convinced um, that the 1970s decision of Western European Communist parties to finally distance themselves from Moscow was really a genuine one. Masi also suggests that Mato made a little bit of an interpretive mistake. And his mistake, according to Masi, was to think that the threat to democracy in Italy in the 1970s was coming from the right. According to Massi, in the 1970s, Italy was not experiencing a period of massive social and economic crisis coupled with the rise of um, imminently powerful right-wing parties. If there was a threat, according to Massi, that threat came from the left and what he deems the disaggregating anti-parliamentary quote unquote, anarchic tendencies of the revolting youth of the 1960s, and from what he sees, of course, as the terroristic violence of the radical left in the form of organizations like the Brigate Rosse. In his memoir, Confronting History, George Massey wrote that since the moment he had been forced to leave Germany in 1933, quote, all I have done since and all I have published has had a political agenda. This interview was no exception. In it, Massey did not hide his deep distrust of the Communist Party, 
his scorn for participants in the events of 1968. And at the same time, he coupled this politics of the present with a tripartite diagnosis of how to save democracy in the long term. Again, through appeal to a liberal democratic nationalist ethos, through a hardened commitment to pluralism, rather than to all encompassing belief systems, and through a politics of alliance building, which does not shy away from cooperating with all those political parties that are genuinely committed to the protection and preservation of parliamentary democracy itself. Now, in closing, I'd like to just say two words about a theme that Masi only references in passing in the interview. But I think it's an important theme that might help us um, think through some of the contemporary relevance of these debates to us today. George Massey, in this interview, suggests that there may be something to some of the critiques that were starting to come forward in the 1960s and the 1970s. These critiques were calling um, for an alternative model of democracy that was different from the one that was defended at the time by many mainstream politicians who saw representative democracy as the way to go and based their vision of coalition on um, an idea of consensus among elite party leaders, and that this consensus among party leaders would in turn breed broad social consensus and unities and unity. Um, the new social movements of the 1960s and 1970s were calling for a model of direct democracy, that is a form of democracy in which people decide on policy initiatives directly, not through the mediation of uh, politicians. Interestingly, in his 1979 interview, Massey suggests repeatedly and in passing that perhaps a more direct democratic form of politics might help solve this paradox that had been driving him crazy for decades, which is to say the paradox of how to bring the, the masses into the state and have them identify with their government. Um, it's not entirely clear what Mossy meant when he references direct democracy. At one point in the interview, he even says that the United States has a form of direct democracy, which by the textbook definition, of course, it does not. Um, but nonetheless, I'd like to suggest in closing that it's perhaps here at the margins of the interview on Aldo Moro that we can um, look for some interesting and provocative suggestions um, and answers to our present day conundrum. Today, of course, we are in the era of post-industrial mass society, not in the era of industrial mass society as Mato and Masi were confronting. We are facing a real surge of racist and anti-democratic forces, both in the United States and in Europe. And some have suggested that a new grand coalition politics of the center could be the winning answer. However, Mato's and Masi's um, engagements with the themes of democracy suggest that ultimately this might not be the way to go in our present time in the sense that a centrist coalition building strategy that focuses on political elites will not solve the paradox of how masses will feel a part of the state rather than alienated by it. To solve that paradox, it might be relevant to listen to Mossy's rather vague call to think beyond our current forms of government and think about building a more direct democracy, a more participatory mode of government governance that's not just about representing people, but um, a form of governance that is truly built by them as well. If we go this route, we may not only have a chance of bringing more people into the process of identifying with um, the government, but also we may have a better chance of developing some practical solutions that actually address the real economic and social grievances that have driven so many citizens in our 21st century into the arms of dangerous and anti-democratic forces. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Juliana. Uh, so next up is uh, Nadia Urbinati, who is uh, Kyriakos Tsakopoulos Professor of Political Theory and Hellenic Studies at Columbia University, up the road. Uh, she is the author of numerous articles, several books, including uh, one called Representative Democracy. She is co-editor of the journal Constellations, International Journal of Critical and Democratic Theory. Uh, she's a frequent writer for La Repubblica and uh, Sole 24 Ore in Italy. Um, and I could go on and on, but I think I'll let her speak to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor also because I do really believe that Aldo Moro is one of those founding fathers we should be uh, honored to have uh, had. So uh, it is very strange that sometimes uh, great uh, personalities are uh, remembered for the way in which they died instead of for the way they lived. And this is the case with Moro. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, disgrace of his life became identified with his entire life. Now, in these last notes, I would like to bring us back to Moro when he was in his early 30s. At the age of uh, 30, he was member of the uh, Constitutional Assemblies uh, of Italy a very young scholar uh, with the great responsibility of writing a constitution that, uh, as Anna Arendt would say, should last forever. All constitutions should be written as they last forever. Uh, and this as if, as if that guides constitutions to be strong uh, through the years and regardless of the difficulties uh, they had to go through. So this was the mentality and the ethos of uh, the uh, young men and women uh, who met uh, in the Constitutional Assembly of Italy. And Moro was one of them. Um, he had, a, as has been said before me, an impressive, uh, although he was so young, an impressive deep sense of what democracy was about. And he had no view, no, uh, I'm sorry, he had no uh, doubts that democracy meant rep representative or parliamentary democracy. It's not simply democracy. We don't have democracy in modernity. We had democracies through some forms of mediation. So the issue here is what kind of mediations? By one person, plebiscitary democracy, or by many actors, uh, more uh, actors possible, like organized parties. So uh, parliamentary democracy has been thus the model that uh, European or continental Europe uh, followed uh, after the collapse of fascism, which was based on another kind of mass democracy with one leader. Um, now, what does it mean to have a constitutional parliamentary democracy? It means, and Moro was very uh, uh, clear about that, that you give parties a nobility. You know, political parties and parties have never been accepted as uh, easily protagonists of political life because they are a part. After all, they are parts, they are not the all. So to make possible to create a democracy based on these collaboration and cooperations uh, by many parts, this was the great achievement of parliamentary democracy. And Moro was very cautious about that. He was, he was very convinced that this was the key to the solution to the problems of fascism. Um, now, thus, I think that Italy owes to him uh, they believe that democracy is parliamentary. They believe that democracy is the, act, is the uh, container of different con uh, uh, collective actors like parties. And for this reason, Moro was convinced also that 
compromise was crucial. It's been said before very beautifully that compromise comes from the uh, uh, medieval Latin of compromises, this mutual, mutual promise. Mutual promise implies many things, and I will show you immediately with a, 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 an example what does it mean that. Mutual compromise means trust. Trust in the, the, the implies the recognition of the adversary that you have in front of you as a dignified adversary. It's no longer a radical enemy. It is an adversary. Trust that he is or she uh, are playing with the same game's rules, with the same rules of the game, not a different kind of games. Second, it is the conviction that plurality or pluralism are fundamental, because if you in, in, uh, use the word compromise, thus mutual trust, you presume that beside you, your mind, your party, your group, there are other kinds of. So pluralism is inscribed inside of compromise. Third, it is also inscribed partisanship and taking side. Take inside, partecipare, in Italy means both take inside and being part of. So it means that if you are an actor in social and political life as a citizen, you cannot be simply floating in the air as neutral. You have to, to stay somewhere, to occupy a space in the political arena. And this means that you are a part or with a part. So to be to siding with and against is part of the game of democracy and is part of a compromise that democracy means. Thus, democracy starts with the constitutional democracy or parliamentary democracy starts with a noble compromise. Noble compromise. Now, as you know, uh, constitutions ha can have different source origins and different history. The democratic history of constitution, which is here, this country, 18th century, starts by the very protagonists. Nobody gave them a constitution. It's not octroyé as the constitutions used to be in the in 19th century. It is made by the very subjects which thus they become actors, they become uh, citizens. So they gave themselves, they create themselves the constitutions. At that point, to be in the political arena as parts, as trusting the others, as in a plurality is the real condition of democracy since the beginning. Thus compromise must be since the beginning the source of the living together as citizens. This was the Italian constitution, which was a compromise made by different parties, not different individuals, not different citizens, but different parties which means that they knew themselves as already parts of parts, as already open to compromise, but not completely open. Compromise doesn't mean that you want to solve pluralism into a unanimity. Compromise presumes that tomorrow there will be another condition for compromise. Compromise is a permanent condition. It's never one today and then we stop tomorrow. Because otherwise, it's like to have elections one time, right? It's not elections. It's simply the um, creation of a, of a regime that is not democratic. So this noble compromise was made by 552 members of the constitutional assemblies. 209 were democratic Christian, 104 were communist, 65 socialist, 49 social democrats, 25 republicans, 22 liberals, 20 uomo qualunque, very bad this man, the first qualunquismo, the first populist kind of anti partist movement was sitting in the making of the rules of the game of Italian democracy. 13 uh, Unione Nazionale, 10 autonomisti or autonomists, 
nine democracy of labor, nine union of national union democratic, seven missed groups. So it was usually pluralistic. And within this pluralism, some important great protagonists uh, run the stage, not individually speaking, but as members of their parties. And one of them was Aldo Moro. Aldo Moro had an important, several important roles in that uh, uh, constitu constitutional assembly as member of the, first, the committee that had to write the first draft. He also was important in uh, mediating between the external actors, like uh, the Azione Cattolica and the, and the um, so-called Catholic world, organized world of the Vatican, connected to the Vatican, and his own parties, and the uh, Constitutional Assembly. And I would like thus to uh, show you, um, as an example, the position he took um, just while he was sitting in the Constitutional Assembly in relation to an important issue, the issue of whether the Italian Constitution should have a preamble like other constitutions, like, for instance, the American Declaration of Independence, like uh, uh, the uh, Statuto Albertino had one made by his... Uh, so the question was, should we have a preamble? That was the, the first important debate uh, in uh, September 46, within which developed then the idea of having the first uh, article of the Constitution without preamble and with the ref reference to labor inside the first article of the Constitution. In that occasion, um, Moro was part of, as I said, the, the, the Christian Democrats organizations outside, outside of the assembly and the Azione Cattolica in particular. And in the debate they had, um, precisely in those uh, days, between June and September of the same 46, uh, the idea uh, coming from within the Azione Cattolica, um, they, they had a meeting in Florence uh, in June, the Settimana Sociale dei Cattolici, between the um, 20, actually in October, uh, actually uh, in October of 45, uh, he, so it, it took tw uh, a time, a, a while. So the issue was, we should have a preamble in order to have a clearly stated that Italy is a Christian or a uh, Catholic kind of country. And there was a huge debate, important debate. Aldo Moro was one among them who intervened in this debate outside of the Constitutional Assembly. And then the solution, the many solutions proposed were to have inside of the, of the text of the Constitution at least the reference to the bene comune, to the common good, and the reference to the natural rights, the diritto naturale, which is the tradition of Thomism and Neo-Thomism. Now, the, uh, the, the discourse of uh, the, the words of, uh, by Moro was the following. I'm, trying, I'm translating them from Italian. This Constitution, so... Um, difficulty negotiated with 10 millions of Marxists and many appendixes more or less, more or less moderated, with the Masons, with anti-clericals, and all, I, 8 millions of democratic Christians. This constitution cannot reproduce completely our points of views. It is good that you know, it is important that we know that there are other people in Italy. They don't share the views we share. And thus, what we can get in that pluralistic domain is the best thing that we can get. So it started from the idea that it is even a good thing that we are not one way of thinking and many, because we can get a betterment or a better situation and better condition. The other uh, reference point I like to make in order to illustrate the idea of uh, compromises, mutual promise, and connected to parliamentary politics uh, and parliamentary democracy, uh, which 
Moro was a theorist, not only a practice, uh, politicians, I like to refer to the debate over the uh, Article 1 of the Constitution. Article 1 is a pivotal article because it is like an ID, the ID of um, the Italian democracy. The first article recites the following. Italy is a democratic republic founded on labor. The sovereignty belongs to the people that exercise it in the forms and the limits of the Constitution. So here there, are, there is everything. There is parliamentary democracy. There is a, a social foundation. Uh, there is the republic organization of, society, of uh, political society. In that occasion, and uh, to, to have this uh, written, this article, it took uh, eight months with different important stages, many important stages, uh, with a civilized conversation and debate. Uh, if you have, are familiar with Italian language, I suggest to enter in the web of the Italian parliament in which you can read the entire transcript of that uh, long debate that was, took one year and a half to have the constitution in a perfect Italian, uh, excellent style, and with people their own friends and enemies, they used to refer to them in the third person all the time to, have the, to, have, to give the sense of the formality and the honorability of that uh, construction. In any case, one of the issues was whether it was enough uh, to have reference to the person as an individual and, uh, or not. And of course, there were many debates. So Dossetti was in favor of introducing a strong personalistic and also organistic conception of society. Lapira was in favor of having labor connected to the organization of labor society and the family also in connections. So many, many disca discussions concerning uh, that article. At a certain point, uh, 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 Togliatti uh, said, look, at, if we are going on to discuss discuss about our ideologies, we cannot find a solution. Very important. We have to put within parentheses ideologies and look for the principles we want to support, that is, the articles of the Constitution. Moro intervene and find a solution to the Togliatti problem, meaning how can we refer together with the similar or identical principles coming from different ideology. How can we put our different ideology between parentheses? The solution of Moro was exactly predictable somehow from us now, not them. Ne meaning we need to consider where we come from. We have one important common base we can refer to, which is a polemical anti-fascist base. So there are differences, but one is common to all of us sitting here. And in the name of that commonality, we have to interpret the state. So he is, is a, in this moment, he gave us a lecture of what is a democratic state. And he says, the democratic republic, he says, is not simply a form of government, but is an idea of public life that mm, longs for, I quote, diminish the authority of the state with a vision of the state as an entity in itself. So a totalitarian state, an, ethi an ethical state. Whereas the state instead should be the expression of our realizations as humans from the point of view of the reference point of view of our social activity, that is labor. So anti-fascism condition for creating a non-totalitarian state and yet based on the social, that is labor. So that was a masterpiece of uh, 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 argument he was uh, uh, able to make. And it was an argument that solved the problem of putting between parentheses uh, ideologies and go straight to the issue of labor, whether should be interpreted in one way or another, then became an open game. It uh, lasted some months, rightly so and came out as, uh, as we uh, and, and I mentioned before. So 
I think my uh, job ends here to say that uh, Moro, um, at the age of 30, was capable of uh, striking the most important compromise of his time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think perhaps I should just say how things are going to work from here. So we have one more speaker, Gabriele Quinti, um, and then we're going to have, I'm going to have, make some very brief concluding remarks, but I want essentially to chair a discussion. So I'm going to ask all the speakers to come up and um, talk to you and take questions from the audience. Um, after that, we will then go to lunch. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce Gabriele Quinti. He is, uh, I think it's already been said, a founding member of the Accademia di Studi Storici Aldo Moro. He's also director of uh, Conoscenza e Innovazione, Knowledge and Innovation, which is a uh, Scuola di Sociologia di Ricerca Interdisciplinare, based in Rome. He is, by training, a sociologist. He is a socio-economist. He teaches at the Istituto Studi Avanzati di Rocca, Rocca di Papa. He's carried out numerous research projects in uh, West Africa, I think Central Africa and Latin America, and probably elsewhere. Uh, and he has been with Alphonse Alfonsi, the prime mover um, with the Mosse Foundation of this of this uh, event today. So I'm very pleased to welcome Gabriele Quinti. Thank you. Uh, uh, you, know, you know very well that Aldo Moro served as Prime Minister and as, or uh, as Minister of Foreign Affairs between 1963 to 1976, with a little interruption in 1973-1974. Uh, for this period, Moro always kept a steady eye on foreign policy. And also in this domain, Moro tended to act strategically, going far beyond an approach aiming to simply manage the current events. In fact, he advocated an innovative approach to a changing international scenario due to the multiplication of independent states, as Sebastiano Cardi has already underlined, coming from the front front and for recognition from the United Nations. Hence, the importance of our knowledge, of our knowledge by Moro, to north-south relations in a moment in which east-west relations were at the center of attention. Moro often spoke at the UN Assembly. On the basis of both uh, a direct reading of his speeches and the interpretation proposed by some, some scholars, at least four main points can be uh, taken into account. First point. Needless to say, UN membership was and is still made up of states. However, Moro, when possible, always preferred to speak of people. This is not a mere rhetorical choice. Moro actually perceived an emerging human conscience with its own voice, as he wrote in 1972, increasingly exerting a pressure on government. Consequently, also the United Nations could be considered, according to Moro, the forum in which uh, the human consciousness finds its expression, as he told in the UN Assembly in 1971. It is useful to notice that this view corresponds to what the UN, United Nations tried to actually become in the following decades, more or less effectively, through the series of the World Summit, in, World Summit in particular in, in, during the 90s, uh, when an increasing role was progressively recognized to, social, uh, so, 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 so to civil society, uh, to many expressions of civil society, entrepreneurial sector, local authorities, the scientific com community, and the social, societal actor in, more, in a more general way. Secondly, second point. Consistently with this view, with this view more so the United Nations as a, uh, as a main arena for countries marginalized in the international scene to have a voice. If I can put the first slide, please. In his speeches to, the, uh, to heads of, di of diplomatic representation in Western and Central Africa, you have the f first uh, sentence, uh, uh, in May 1971 and the UN Assembly in October 1972, the second one, uh, Moro dwelled upon the issue highlighting the key role of the United Nations in uh, speeding up the inclusion of, in the international scene of people from emerging countries. 
In the same perspective, Moro also expressed the need to reform the UN Economic and Social Council in order to improve United Nations development efforts and to foster a greater participation of developing countries in the Council itself. Later, after the approval in Italy of the first organic law on international cooperation in December 1971, Moro decided that the Italian development aid should have been mostly deliver delivered from the multilateral channel, and therefore from the United Nations too, rather than the bilateral channel preferred by almost all European countries. Consistently with the overall approach, in 1965, during the Moros of First Cabinet, Italy was one of the promoters of the establishment of the United Nations Development Program. Third point. Moro considered the UN as fundamental to ensure the dialogue among people in case over communication channels were precluded. Moro refused the bipolar approach and the UN exclusion from negotiation, putting a strong focus on the United Nations in managing its military, military political and economic aspect. More broadly, and you can put the next slide, please, uh, United Nations appeared to Moro as essential to ensure world peace. Idualo Dupont, at this point, many times, and in his speech in the United Nations General Assembly in 1970, highlight, uh, highlighting that the United Nations had to be reference frame for the re resolution of international crisis, Moro reiterated the full confidence of the Italian government in the United Nations and in its larger system, explaining the, the need to invite the United States and Soviet, uh, Soviet Union allies to invest in multilateral choral action. However, this view did not prevent Moro from, uh, from acknowledging in the same time the limits of the United Nations and therefore the pivotal role played not only by states but also by other multilateral actors such as the European institution. However, according to Moro, peace had to be also prim prim primarily connected to a rebalancing of North-South relations and to global development. In this regard, in 1969, he presented at the UN General Assembly his Concezione Integrale della Pace, underlying the need to remove the deepest causes of war, anger, misery, as well as the social and technological gaps. Moreover, he suggested a global commitment for the reduction of poverty in all its ramifications, without sacrificing and mortifying human value, but through a global strategy of development. It would not be a mistake to say that Moro indirectly contributed to, to inspire the Millennium Development Goals. Continuing on the same line of thought, at the 25th United General Assembly in 1970, Moro argued that it was necessary to link the decade of disarmament with the second decade of development by locating to the third world development the resources freed from disarmament, recognizing the positive action of United Nations at this regard. You can refer to this sentence. Fourth, fourth point, fourth and last point. Aldo Moro considered the United Nations as a dynamic institution, able to make its own rules evolve in relation to world events. As already said, you can put the next one, please. As already said, he played in 1971 an active role in the UN Economic and Social Council reform, as, I say, as, as already stated before. Moreover, when he served as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Italy started to develop its proposal for the, UN, for the reform of the UN Security Council by suggesting, together with Mexico, the establishment of some semi-permanent members of the security, UN Security Council. This and similar over-proposal will be elaborated by Italy in the following years, mainly from 1993 to 1999, in the frame of the UN debate of the UN Security Council reform that still lasts today. In the, more, in the more vision of the United Nations, international politics is more and more considered as a worldwide context characterized by powerful processes of global interdependence. To a certain extent, Moro had, had an anticipatory vision of the impact of globaliz globalization, of north-south dynamics, and of sustainable development. As I said, the idea, the idea of people, as it was used by Moro, underlined his focus on social dynamics and the human substance of politics. His view of Africa and Latin America was not that of a set of states and government, but of a set of dynamic and complex society. 
The four point discussed so far, so far allow us to capture what, as a, a, a sociologist, I consider probably the most original features of Moro's thought. He was one of the few politicians, politici politicians to perceive the, the shift from modern to the so-called postmodern society, recognizing the increasing capacity of ordinary people to, to autonomously think and act as well as to build up their own life, projects and identity. Moro viewed this trend in both its potential and its risk for the stability of political system also in the international dimension. In his speeches, including those held at the United Nations, As uh, United Nations Assembly, he often dwells upon the fragility of the state in facing more and more dynamic and diver diversified society. You could see here. It, was, it is not surprising that Giorgio Moss, in the interview given to Alfonso Alfonsi, highlights the moral worries about the fragility of democracy in mass societies, but not massified, worries which also Moss shared. Where power, where power is no longer centralized, but scattered all over society. And you can close this uh, last slide. Let me go a little bit more in depth into this shift, since it allows us to understand why Moro's thought is still of interest for us. The shift from modern to postmodern society is involving complex and painful evolution processes for all the social institutions in which modernity has been built, politics, science, institutional religious, state, public authorities, family, etc. As director of a research center, Knowledge and Innovation, I am, I am observing this shift in the domain of science-society relationship. However, the same trends in different ways are also affecting political institutions. In general, a set of general processes across all social institutions can be observed. I am referring, for example, the diminishing authority of social institutions and their leaders, political leaders, scientists, etc., couples with the diffusion of antagonist attitudes, anti-political attitudes, anti-scientific attitudes, etc. The crisis of intermediate structures, party, trade unions, university, public administration, etc., in managing increasing, increasingly fragmented and diversified social, societal demand and expectation. The people's distrust, distrust, disaffection and disinterest toward the life and, and destiny, for example, of political, scientific or state institutions. The oversimplification of the public discourse on scientific, political, religious or ethical issues. The declining resources allocated to many social institutions, often coupled with an increasing demand for accountability, transparency and control over public expenditure. The, re the reaction to these changing pictures also tend to converge, reducing cost, establishing accountability regime, improving efficiency, introducing new ethical standards, adopt simplified languages and more attractive communication styles, introduction introducing in participatory mechanism. It is however difficult to say if uh, uh, it is it is uh, however difficult to say to what extent this reaction is really, really effective. Simplifying, we can say that the traditional social contract connecting people and their institution is rapidly changing and in many aspects is, is even collapsing with impacts which are difficult to predict. I suppose that Aldo Moro somehow perceived the risk involved in, with this change, especially in the last part of his life. In my opinion, these changes are not positive or negative in themselves. This mainly depends upon how we will be able to understand and manage them appropriately. And I feel we are still far for, from attaining this objective. Therefore, the key question is to take a action for monitoring their evolution and cap capturing the fair feature, their features so as to turn them from more or less unpredictable drift to more managed transitional processes. Probably this will also require important advancement in social sciences. And I think we are very far from uh, this objective. I think this is a step to take if we really want, as Aldo Moro suggested in his last un unfinished article, dominare con intelligenza gli avvenimenti. 
to master events with Intel intelligence. Thank you very much. Thanks to Cucasa Italiana Zerilli Marimo, to Giorgio Morse program, and to United Nations, uh, uh, Italian representative to, to, to United Nations for helping us to organize this event. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gabriele. Uh, I'll just say a few short words, and I'm going to invite everybody to come up on stage, and perhaps we can put the lights on. Um, I, I don't have a lot to say. I'm not an expert on this. I just perhaps wanted to add a personal note. Uh, I was living in Rome in 1978. I was working on my PhD. I was 25. Um, and um, I remember very vividly what it felt like those 55 days. Um, and uh, it's something you don't forget. So like many people, and as Stefano Albertini said in his opening remarks, uh, my sense of who Aldo Moro was was primarily determined by how he died. Uh, after that, however, I became a teacher of history, uh, and I started finding out quite a lot more about the history of the Christian Democrats, about the Costituente, about the formation of the Italian Republic. So I kind of filled in the picture retrospectively of who Moro was. And I must say today I've learned a lot more about who he was um, through, your, through your speeches. I just wanted to pick up maybe three or four things that I thought might be interesting to synthesize what I've heard so far and start off the discussion. Uh, firstly, and, and I have read the, the interview with um, uh, uh, Mossa, and I find it incredibly interesting, actually. It's, it's a kind of, in some ways, an ancient text now. It's 1979, so it's getting on for being 40 years old. And some of it, of course, has been superseded by political developments, um, so it does s seem a little bit like a an old text, but it's also extremely contemporary because we're living in an age in which parliamentary system is no longer stable. Uh, it's threatened from many sides. Um, the kind of instability that we're seeing now is not the one that, Mo that Mosse knew, um, but the rise of populism, particularly right-wing populism, the challenges to uh, the system, uh, um, a, a culture in which you can have an anti-system candidate elected as president of the United States or can challenge the whole um, political system in Italy, I'm talking about the Movimento Cinque Stelle, is now a very real um, um, political situation for us. So the things that M Mossa was saying in 1979 can, I think, very easily be adapted to the situation now, and that's why this, um, this text is very, very, very relevant today. Um, the things that have stood out for me, but others might have struck you more, have been, I think, firstly, um, in, in particularly in, in this reconstructing who Mora was politically, um, this importance of reconciling and, and balancing different interests within Italy, um, both um, different party interests, so obviously the opening to the socialists in 1963, uh, the willingness to open to the communists in 1978, um, are, um, I think, signs of a... Um, a very radical and very different kind of attitude towards the centrality of parliament and the need to broaden it in order to uh, assure a mass base and the, and the continuity of that system, that Moro was a visionary, I think, in understanding that. Um, and I think Renata Moro, in his opening, talked about the fact that he's balancing interests not just within parliament or around parliament, but also within the country, within the nation. He came from uh, the province of Lecce. He's a southerner. He's very aware of the need to reconcile different interest, interests within Italy. So Giuliana talked about the uh, Alto Adige question and his role in, in, in solving that. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, Gabriele has just talked about the importance of his interest in balancing different um, uh, uh, interests at global level through the UN. Um, so what he did at a, in a, on a national plane in Italy, he projected onto an international plane through his uh, speeches at the UN. Um, the second uh, thing that stood out for me is um, the this idea, which of course he shared very much with uh, Mossa, that parliamentary democracy was not guaranteed for all time, it's precarious. Uh, these were both men who lived through fascism, uh, but of course they were born around the time of the Russian Revolution, which of course we've just celebrated the centenary of a few days ago, November 7th. Um, and they were aware that parliamentary systems could uh, live and die, and they were open to challenges from both political extremes. Um, so this sense that even as 
you know, we get into the 60s, um, sort of 15 years or 20 years into the Italian Republic, that system is not stable, as of course the events of the late 60s and 70s showed. And of course Moro's own death showed that there were serious threats to the legitimacy and the stability of Parliament. So this importance, I think, of, of, of not taking for granted the continuity or the future of parliamentary democracy was absolutely central. Um, the third point, I think, is the point that several speakers have stressed, I think particularly came out from, from Nadia Obinati's discussion of his role in the Costituente in 1945 to 47, which is the need to compromise. But several speakers spoke, spoke about this. This I didn't actually know this etymology of compromissus, but I will now remember that, that it means promising together or making a, a pledge together. So, um, and I think Nadia showed beautifully really how his work in the Costituente able to reconcile very, very different positions, that of Togliatti and the Communist Party with um, the kind of more hardline um, Catholics in, 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 in that was, you know, an extraordinary piece of, of balancing, uh, but also done on the basis of real commitment to the principle of pluralism and um, finding a common ground. And it may have been Togliatti who said we have to put ideology aside, but it was Mora who seemed to actually somehow find a solution to that. Um, the final point, I think, is coming back to what I said earlier, is, is how we might apply this to today. I mean, I am a historian and I therefore I'm very resistant to anybody trying to say, okay, that all happened a long time ago, how do we apply it now? It seems to me that you always have to make two moves. The first move is to understand what somebody said very precisely within the historical circumstances in which they said it. You know, Moro is not alive now. Um, he died nearly 40 years ago. Um, the world has changed hugely. But we have to understand the world he was operating in. Uh, from the 40s when he was a young man of 30 at the Costituente to his death um, in between, of course, becomes a leader of the Christian Democrat Party at the age of just 42, I think, in 1959. So he, um, that, was, that was his time. It was uh, fascism when he was a Catholic activist, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and most of the 70s. Our world is very different, but not completely different. We still have some of the same challenges. How do we secure the legitimacy of Parliament? How do we regain public confidence in it? How do we operate in a way to bring in more actors so that those actors actually sustain the parliamentary system rather than challenge it? These are the key questions. It hasn't changed that much, but we have very different players in the system now. Um, and I think that the, we therefore have to make, make this double move of both reconstructing Moro in his own time and Mossa in his own time, and also seeing how much of this we can apply to the debates today. So I'd very much like to, to open that up, I think, for discussion. I'd like to invite all the speakers back up on stage now. Um, and I will welcome, uh, please, involvement from the audience, um, but of course, interaction with each other if you'd also like to do that. So please, please come back again. Thank you. Uh, I think we have two microphones which we can pass around. Um, between us. So. Julian, is it possible to drop the light a bit? It's a bit bright on us, just to make it slightly less glaring. Better, thank you. Thanks very much. Very simple, very short. I was writing a lot of names here because I was a young student in Italy at the time, 45, 47. And I have heard some of the names, but not very many. Especially, I haven't heard anything about the relation between Moro, which uh, is our hero today, and Fanfani, who was not a hero, I think, at the time. Thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs>
Uh, congratulations. Just a uh, quick question, Moro and the Risorgimento. I believe, I wonder if uh, um, the statement of in his plan to bring masses into the government comes from the way that Risorgimento was achieved, which is the exclusion of the Catholic fraction and uh, the Southern masses. Moro, I believe, was aware of that and uh, uh, how he worked in this. Uh, you know, to achieve this um, uh, extension or rights or extension of participation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for um, a very informative um, presentation, for very informative presentations from all of you, actually. Um, my question is about the idea of mediation. Many of you have been talking about the mediation, uh, the figure of mediation that actually Moro was. And I wanted to reflect a little bit on the mediatization of his figure along the time. Because you all have said that today we're actually re releasing the memory of Moro, the figure of Moro from the prison. That was a figure mediated uh, by the media. So. The, the media rituals made of him a celebrity, um, uh, a kind of a celebrity in a sort of political, cultural, uh, social way. And so his political discourse was not so well known at the time either because uh, the media didn't, or I don't, I don't know if um, he was um, not willing to speak through the media, his political discourse, or if the media were not actually focusing on him. I still remember Pasolini talking about his way of talking in a very kind of incomprehensible way, and, uh, but still he was saying that he was il meno implicato di tutti, the, the least um, implicated of always, uh, of, of all uh, the others in uh, the horrible things that were made in Italy at that time. So my question is about uh, this great absent, the media, uh, from, from this process. He was saying that the, the democracy was a process, but also the media made, have been making this process and been making a lot of changes along, along the time, um, especially with the figure of Moro. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the victims of this uh, conflation of the last uh, days of Moro and his life is um, an assessment of his uh, value as a statesman. Uh, and I think uh, more recently this conversation has taken place in, uh, um, in the literature uh, the concept of state that uh, Moro uh, supported and pursued uh, throughout his life um, has uh, uh, created him as uh, an international figure uh, in a situation in which Italy was under a sort of a limited sovereignty and the concept of uh, historical compromise has been also considered as one of the elements that contributed to uh, his abrupt uh, end. So I wanted to ask whether this analysis of Moro as a statement uh, is being also reconsidered in light of uh, his assessment, the assessment of his, uh, his life. I have also a second question to Gabriele Quinti about uh, the institution that is leading, uh, K and I, maybe you, you could provide us with some more details on about what it is uh, doing. Thank you. Um, maybe we should just take one more question and perhaps we can have some responses. Any questions? Yes. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the um, speakers for the profundity and everything they said. It was really an enlightening morning. Um, 
it's not really a question, but is uh, a sort of guess that we can try to make. I was fascinated by what, uh, um, among all the other things that I heard, uh, what Gabriele Quinti was saying while uh, he was talking about the United Nations and uh, how Moro was uh, strongly uh, supporting the role of the United Nations and stuff. So maybe it would be, since we're all trying to bring the legacy of his thought, uh, how can we make a guess of how he would have reacted when in the times of the Iraqi invasions, in, 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 the um, Afghanistan invasion by George Bush and the, the, the denying somehow the role of the United Nations, uh, how would have Morrow reacted to that? It's just a guess, it's not a real question. It's Yeah, I would like to ask a question about Mossi's interpretation of fascism and nationalism and how he emphasized the role of uh, civic religion in, and uh, mass participation in fascism. What happens to the space occupied by civil religion in post-war parliamentary democracies? I would like to focus on the question on media. Um, when when he died in 78, the media was, they were not yet the video media, I mean, newspaper, yes. They were not yet so prominent, although they were after in the 60s, late 60s, they started being. In any case, um, he uh, was not like many politicians in his days, uh, open to uh, reveal his private life to the media, for instance. He was a very public figure. Uh, the private life never appeared as far as uh, we can remember. But he was able, though, to have a very um, uh, imaginations to capture in few words the difficulty of the words he was using, because it was, his speech was very complicated. But the ability he had to create a phantasmagoric and imaginary uh, synthesis was fantastic. You know. Um, the Compromesso Storico uh, was the name used in the Communist Party. In his own party, the equivalent was um, Convergenze Parallele. Convergenze Parallele is something incredibly irrational, unless you don't see things in perspective, because it means parallel convergence, parallels converging, or, or, converg or co convergence parallel. You see them in perspective, indeed in perspective, two parallels, they become one point. So he, wa he wanted to, with this, this Im image, to make, um, to make a difficult, a difficult uh, fact to be accepted by his own uh, people possible, meaning it is far in the future, this parallel, but uh, we, sto we, sh we should start now. Did I say something wrong? And so it was kind of uh, uh, starting now, but see the future. So it means two things very important. One, not, not now, meaning it's not in, we are not investing ourselves now, but in the future. So we can accept this walk because it's not now. So you can thus convince the very stubborn or radical among the democratic Christians, and you can also convince those who are more pragmatic. So he had these capabilities of putting together uh, 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 complex ideas in these images, uh, I would say. Um, I don't know whether I answered to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me change another. 
No, um, I, I would like to, uh, to say something on this. I uh, fully agree on uh, Moro's capability in uh, creating uh, this kind of images. On the specific case, uh, uh, um, I have uh, uh, some information because uh, uh, I mentioned the, the volume of which uh, uh, Moss uh, interview was uh, the introduction, now it came uh, individual, and it had notes, including linguistic notes, that were made by a less, uh, Italian lexicographer uh, Mario Medici, and uh, he went through mo almost all published, uh, not published, existing printed uh, speeches of Moro in, uh, um, available, and uh, what he found, there, there was no mention of uh, Convergenze Parallele. But he said in television. No, okay. no, 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 that's more interesting because uh, it came from uh, um, Scalfari interview to Aldo Moro, and he said, if you want, but Scalfari said, if you want uh, to have uh, um, Aldo Moro action, we must think in terms of in Convergenza Parallele. But apparently, we don't have this uh, image uh, in, in the first time. But we have, of course, and I think there are uh, scholars that study the fact that many famous men are famous for uh, especially a sentence they never uh, created. In this case, uh, it may be. Then, of course, and then yeah, that was. In the end, uh, also ironically, <laughs> in fact, no, it, because uh, the idea was that of uh, uh, convergence democratiche, ah. no? democratic convergence to move in parallel and so on. So the thing was there. But, uh, um, and in fact, he used ironically, um, in the case on the dialogue with communists, he yeah. said, if I may quote a sentence that I'm not sure I, I'm quoting, uh, if it was mine or, or attributed to me by others, that this would be a case of convergence parallele. Right. No, but, um, and um, in general, uh, it is interesting, um, uh, this element, but I, I fully agree on, uh, on the fact there will be many examples to be made uh, to uh, images that could capture. And also, I think, uh, with Nadia um, stressed it in many works uh, uh, more, also in that time, the mediation was also, uh, mass mediation was not made only by the media. It was made, for instance, by uh, parties, by uh, organizations. In these, um, now there is uh, also a, a visual archive of uh, Moro. You see him speaking to an enormous amount of people uh, hearing to him and uh, uh, waiting for him to speak. So, and associations were a form of mediation. So, the mediations were uh, more than with media. The relationship of Moro the me and the media is a field of study in which original studies are being made. I'm uh, um, not uh, uh, the one who's doing it, but uh, as academia, we are um, collecting some uh, of these. And it's interesting because it's complex. He participated in some of the first uh, Pol uh, television debates in a particular way. There, is, there are studies on the way in which uh, uh, Morris Mage, even his body images, was used or abused in, uh, in the communication. Uh, with Moss, uh, we discussed a little bit about how um, Mor uh, Moros abduction was used in, in a form of uh, mass ritual uh, to establishing uh, a, a certain point and so on. But uh, this field is a field uh, growing and uh, yielding also results that uh, to some extent are not commonsensical, I think. I stop here. Yeah, thank you. Um, <coughs> I, I forgot to ask you, 
going in order, I'll just say something very, very briefly. Uh, but uh, the question about the Risorgimento and the exclusion of the Southern masses and Moro's relationship to that. I mean, Moro is a Southerner, um, and I think, as we know, the one of the things that fascism did was basically immobilize the South for 20 years. There wasn't any effective um, um, treatment of the land question, um, incorporation of the southern masses. It was done in a symbolic way through, you know, Mussolini going and saying, you know, but there was no real action. So all the action really takes place after 1945. There's the Gulo decrees, these communist decrees that give common land to the peasants. There's, of course, intense peasant agitation after 1945. Uh, and then the Christian Democrats have a series of measures, the land reform of 1950, before that, De Gasperi goes to Matera um, and says he'll do something about extreme poverty in the South. There's the uh, Casa per Mezzogiorno. So, you know, a number of actions are taken in which Moro participates, which are to do with integrating the South. I mean, we could say more than that, but he's certainly part of that movement. Um, on the thing about media and mediatization, I just agree with Nadia Urbinati. I mean, this is something I work on. Everything changes in Italy in 1975-76. Moro dies in 1978. 1975, you have the reform of the RAI, so control of the RAI. The public television is transferred from government to parliament. And then 1976, you have the ruling of the Constitutional Court, which in effect, although not in intention, opens the airwaves to private broadcasters also at national level. That's a kind of not what the Constitutional Court wants, but it's what Berlusconi and others do. So by the time you get really into the early 80s, the media landscape changes completely. Um, television's multi-channel, it's in color. Um, already in the early 80s, I remember going to conferences in Italy where people were talking about spectacularization and personalization of politics. The Italian politics was becoming more like American politics. It was how you could handle yourself on television, how you could address a mass audience that mattered and not the content of your speech. Um, and of course, you know, you fast forward to 2000 and Six is that right? No, two thousand must be two two thousand eight election campaign. I remember the face off between Prodi and Berlusconi. Prodi had much more intelligent things to say, but he spent the debate looking at his knees. Um, Berlusconi said a few sound bites, and he sounded effective. So the kind of phenomenon of the politician who can win a, um, a, an election on the basis of just simply being a good media personality or sounding demagogic, which of course is a threat to the parliamentary system, is something that really develops after Moro's death. Um, I think, and that's important to remember. Well, I would like only to add something about the three uh, first questions. Uh, Moro Fanfani. Uh, after the Gaspari, there is no doubt that in Italian Christian democracy, Moro and Fanfani were the two leading figures. They were very different. They were competitors, even adversaries inside the party, but it has to be said that it is demonstrated and proved by Fanfani's diaries that have been published recently, they respected them very much. And it is very interesting, two, these two parallel figures had a very similar <coughs> story in their arrival to Christian democracy. Both of them arrived to Christian democracy very late late 1945, not 1943, both had many difficulties in accepting the Catholic party. Moro was in the South, no resistance. The South wind, that is the protest of the South against the way in which the anti-fascist parties were dividing monarchy and people were considering the South the undeveloped and barbarian part of the country. Moro was not monarchist, but he knew too much the South not to consider it problematic to split the country on that subject. Fanfani was in Switzerland after September the 8th and the collapse of the Italian state and the Italian army, he flew to Switzerland. And he refused to enter into the Christian Democratic Party for two years. The reason was that he was not confident, as Moro was, in the former Catholic experience before fascism. Moro Fanfani belonged to a new generation who considered exactly what has been said about Moss's interpretation of fascism. Fascism gave wrong answers to right questions. 
the former popolari, that is the former Catholics, were trying to bring solutions, Italy, back to liberal democracy before fascism. This was not anymore possible, according to those people. So they considered, at the beginning, Christian democracy as in continuity with the PPI, that is the, the Catholic Party, the Sturzos Party. They uh, were fearing that the new party would have limited itself to promote only parliamentary democracy. They were asking for something new. Uh, and there was also the problem of the use of religion in politics. This generation had a very strong Christian impulse, but at the same time feared that as it had happened in the 1920s, a Catholic party would have created problems, divided Catholics, so they would have preferred different solution, a pluralist approach of Catholics to politics. So they arrived, Christian democracy, late and with many, many problems, and even with some polemic attitude towards the first, the Gaspari. Uh, the Risorgimento, uh, only one point. Uh, after Ernesto Galli della Loggia's book on September the 8th, many think that in Italy, the fatherland collapsed totally with the end of fascism. It's not absolutely true. When Emilio Gentile wo wrote a book about the myth of a great Italy, he discovered that Moro was one of those men who continued to propose the necessity of a strong Italian patriotism even after the war. Moro's language complicated, yes, but not so much. We have made today so many quotations. Were they so ununderstandable, so difficult? I think not. So why the idea of such a complicated political language? I think it, it is not only meant. There is something true in it. When Moro became prime minister, that is 1963, one of the more widespread Italian magazines commented in an article the thing in this way, who is this man? This man doesn't want to have interview, doesn't want that people talk about him, doesn't want to, that his positions and ideas will be too much known. From which kind of planet is this politician coming? This is what is true, is that Moro was not, a, well, was not a charismatic leader in the sense that public opinion imagined a charismatic leader had to, to be. We know, for example, that by, through some researchers that Moro had many difficulties with television at the beginning. He didn't like it, didn't want to participate. So Moro's language was high. In a certain sense, it was not so ununderstandable, but this was high. It was part of a different tradition. Even it is um, true that Moro's language changed. We are beginning a work of the national edition of his works. If you read Moro's political speech to the party, and the political speeches he made in the South, in Apulia, we will find a very relevant difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of these terrific questions. And um, I think I'll just focus on one question that others have not yet um, dealt with, which is the question of George Mossy's thoughts on civic religion and how that changes for him after World War II. I, if I understood the question correctly, it's something like Masi's interpretation of the interwar years and fascism is bound up with his idea that, of course, um, these totalitarian phenomena are putting forward civic religions of their own. 
how therefore does he see the years after World War II in Europe? And I think that that really gets at the core, one, one core paradox of the interview that he gives on Aldomaro himself, where it's evident that he is within, so deeply within this framework that he has a little bit of trouble stepping out and actually seeing the other dimensions of who Aldo Moro was. Um, to be more specific, George Masi sees nationalism as a civic religion that kind of takes the place of um, the religions of the book in, in Europe. And he, um, and he notes that Aldomaro himself was uncomfortable with um, the idea of a religious state. He was not interested in um, actually using religion to ground the state, right? So he wasn't interested in um, restoring that old form of legitimacy. And that was actually a theme um, in some of George Mossy's very early writings from 1957, his book, The Holy Priest Tense, which um, through the the latter part of his life, he deemed one of his most important books, even though uh, it's not at all one of his most famous ones. That's a book in which he's wrestling with the question to which it's even possible um, on an intellectual level to provide a religious grounding for the state. And ultimately, he answers with Machiavelli, as he sees it, that no, that's, um, that's a non-starter <laughs> in the first place. So he, he sees... Aldomaro as his ally in that in providing that answer of no in terms of um, is the answer to the national the hyper nationalist racist civic religions that um, Nazism for instance put forward is the answer a return to religion um, according to Masi Aldomaro says no although many of his um, colleagues in Christian democracy according to Masi did say yes and according to Masi that's also why Christian democracy was so appealing to broad swaths of the population, not just in Italy, but in other European countries after World War II, because in fact, it was carrying forward another form of, um, another kind of total answer to what role individuals had in the state, a kind of a fusion of politics and religion. Um, but to return to what I was saying earlier, in a sense, this whole framework for Masi, I think, is a little bit crippling or limiting because what he entirely misses is what you so um, usefully laid out, which is that Aldomaro was also an internationalist. He was also a European federalist. He was not simply and exclusively an Italian nationalist. Whereas on Masi's read, that is how he appears. He appears as someone who puts forward a sanitized and acceptable liberal democratic nationalism that has its direct connections to the Risorgimento, but that does not, in fact, point to some of the perhaps more innovative aspects of Aldo Moro's proposal, which extended beyond Italian borders, which sought to decenter Europe at a time where that was not at all commonplace, right? His comments on Africa were um, very much ahead of the times, or at least kind of pointing in a, in a new sort of direction, that the importance of the United Nations is not as a way to shore up Europe, it's a, as a way to shore up a, a more global model of belonging. Um, so I think in a sense, because Masi's framework remained with him, um, he missed some of the, these other more internationalist dimensions of Mato's thoughts and, and actions. Thank you. First of all, uh, I'll, uh, I will add uh, two words more on uh, conoscenza e innovazione, knowledge and innovation, because there was a specific question. Uh, uh, Knowledge and Innovation, Conoscenza e Innovazione, is a social research center doing not only research but also many other activities linked with the management of the results of research, uh, institutional building, capacity building, uh, technical assistance, monitoring and evaluation, uh, etc. 
people uh, uh, in knowledge and innovation uh, has worked in more than 70 countries around the world, mainly in Europe, uh, Latin America, and Africa, and uh, Middle East and North, North Africa region, and uh, cooperating with uh, many international organizations, European Union, United Nations, uh, international uh, financial institutions like World Bank and so on. And uh, our aim, uh, in just one or two sentences, uh, is uh, to contribute uh, to improve uh, the uh, capacity of social research uh, to better understanding uh, the complexity of uh, human realities, of the complexity of today's societies, uh, characterized by uh, very complex uh, transition processes, uh, uh, institutional transition, social transition, uh, energy transition, demographic transition, uh, epidemiological transition, uh, urbanization transition, and so on. The, 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 the high complexity of, uh, society, of today's society should be better understand, uh, should, should be better understood uh, and uh, um, social sciences, sociology in particular, but not only sociology, should give uh, a, an improved contribution uh, in uh, this sense. And social sciences must do this in an inter interdisciplinary context, uh, that is uh, cooperating not only among social sciences, but also beyond social sciences. Again, let me give a very little example. Uh, we have ended uh, a few months ago a program uh, concerning the transition towards uh, low ca towards high carbon to low carbon uh, society in the, uh, concerning the management of uh, the, en the energy systems. Of course, this program has not been implemented mainly by social sciences. It has been ma ma implemented mainly by uh, engineers, uh, experts of uh, uh, energy issues, etc. But our contribution uh, it was uh, to understand uh, all the societal issues linked to the energy transition, both uh, in the sense of obstacles, but also in the sense of resources in the society that can be, uh, can be uh, identified and valorized, valorized, valorized for uh, uh, helping uh, such a complex transition as that is uh, the energy transition. Concerning the question of United Nations, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, I think it's very difficult and perhaps impossible to answer, but let me uh, underline four elements of uh, the, my understanding of uh, United Nations vision of Aldo Moro that perhaps uh, can help, uh, can help uh, not to give an answer, but uh, to imagine perhaps uh, an answer. First of all, uh, my impression is that uh, for Aldo Moro, uh, United Nations should contribute uh, anyway, in, in any way, to guarantee peace. Uh, this is my impression. And to guarantee peace uh, beyond uh, any difficulty, beyond uh, any problem, uh, etc. Second, uh, my impression is that according to Aldo Moro, United Nations were, fund were fundamental for doing any mediation, any kind of mediation, until the last, uh, the last minute, the last second, uh, for avoiding, uh, for avoiding uh, conflict and for constructing a uh, worldwide, uh, worldwide, constructing worldwide uh, relation. Third element, uh, according to Aldo Moro, Aldo Moro seems, uh, according to me, as a, a high propensity to understand as better as possible what can happen after what can happen after, uh, after uh, uh, a conflict or after any kind of event, to try to, not to, pre to predict, but to try to uh, understand the, so the so societal, uh, so social characteristics of uh, the reality and try to understand what can happen uh, after. And uh, last element, what I said during my intervention, according to Moro, there was not only states, but beyond states there was people, and uh, perhaps um, greater attention to people of Afghanistan, to people of Iraq, beyond their regimes, beyond their uh, statual uh, organization at the time of these wars. I think that is, is impossible to, uh, um, to uh, answer to this question, but perhaps these elements can help uh, to understand the idea. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, we actually didn't get in the discussion to what I said we might get to, which is how some of this might apply to the world today, but maybe that's a whole other conference. Um, I would like to thank everybody who's taken part.
So Nadia Urbinati, Gabriele Quinti, Renato Moro, Giuliana Chemidis, um, and uh, Alfonso Alfonsi. Uh, also thanks Sky Doni from the George Mossa Foundation. Everybody who's made this possible, Stefano Albertini, director of the Casa Italiana, uh, the Casa Italiana staff, Kostia Kostic, Julian Sachs, who's been back there in the, in the tech room, um, the assistants who've been video conferencing this. Um, and I invite you all to come upstairs and have some lunch with us. Thank you.